everybody. So I promised I would first start off by going over this diagram. So let's start by ignoring this data. Those are essentially repeats of the experiment at different pHs. And for this, to understand this at first, we need to just consider one. So what is this telling us? This is the telling us the number of product molecules per minute, the rate, right, based on the amount of substrate. So to understand what's going on here, you need to imagine an enzyme with an active site and imagine a substrate that'll fit into that active site. Now, as they increase the amount of substrate, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 4, and 8, and so on, so doubling the amount of substrate, that's going to change the concentration of substrate in our container here. So one thing you need to understand is the substrate and the enzyme have to run into each other in the right way. So the, the substrate is bouncing around inside of this container until it runs into the correct orientation, right? And so there's a little bit of randomness to this, right? It's not going to just automatically go directly to the enzyme. So if there's not a high concentration of them, if there's not a high amount at 0.5, the rate can only go so fast because the substrate will not always be hitting the enzyme. So that's this rate right here, right? Now, when you add one full gram, right, here, we see that the... Um, number of molecules per minute increases greatly. It goes from about 150 molecules per minute to about 300 molecules per minute that the enzyme can process. Well, why so much faster? Why is that rate so much higher? Well, that's because now you have a bunch more substrate in here, and the likelihood that any one substrate will hit that active site is much greater. They're all just bouncing around in here, right? But there's always going to be at least one of them that's running into it. At two, it looks like it slows down, but let's think again here. What this is really saying is that for a value of one gram, right, we have a rate that goes from 150 molecules per minute up to 300 molecules per minute. At two grams, we go from 100 and, or for, we go from a little less than 300 molecules per minute up to 350. So actually 350 is the maximum rate, the maximum number of molecules per minute that the enzymes can process. And so adding more at this point doesn't change the value, not because the reaction isn't going, but it's just already going as fast as it can. That's why this is about the rate of the reaction. Okay, so it's calculating, it's showing you the rate values. All right, so it's that third diagram. Now, um, if I erase all this and we look at it another way, if we look at it in terms of the different pHs, 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, we see that the, the, the maximum possible rate, 350 molecules per minute, is achieved at a pH of 7, right? If you put a lot of the substrate in, you can get a maximum rate at a pH of 9 of about, what, 225 or so, right? And, the, the, you know, the, you still get a pretty high rate. It's faster than the rate when there's not very much substrate. The fastest rate when there's not very much substrate is only about 140. So, it's, so, so you can get at a pH of 9, if you add a ton of the substrate, you can get a higher rate of reaction than you can if you have very little substrate, right? So the, the pH is just not, and I, I like that word, that optimal or ideal. It's not ideal, but if you have enough substrate and you have the, if you, even in a non-ideal situation, you'll still be producing more product molecules than you are in an ideal situation, but with less than ideal amounts of the substrate. So that's that diagram. Um, but the other thing I wanted to talk about had to do with enzyme shape and structure. This is what I alluded to at the beginning, but I didn't really go into it. So you should be familiar with all of the words and this diagram overall. Substrate, enzyme substrate, enzyme substrate complex, enzyme product complex, enzyme product, and so on. Um, this right here 
Notice what's going on here. Here the enzyme fits into the shape, but then the shape changes. This is called induced fit. And it's okay to think of enzymes as being a lock and a key, but it's a little more than that. Yes, they're sort of lock and key shaped, but once the substrate binds with the to create the enzyme substrate complex, there is a shape change. It goes from this shape to this shape, and it's that change in the shape of the enzyme that causes the reaction or makes the reaction occur more easily. So it, it is important to understand enzymes don't change shape from the beginning to the end. However, in between, they do change shape while they're carrying out the reaction. Okay, um, now, enzymes are proteins. Okay, and we know where proteins come from, right? Proteins come from an amino acid sequence. That's the primary structure. Now, it might be worth reviewing primary, secondary, quaternary, tertiary, quaternary structures, but at the very least, you need to understand that an amino acid sequence creates a protein and enzymes are proteins. So, if we want the protein shape to change, right, if the cell has to make a different kind of enzyme, they're going to have to change the amino acid sequence. Or, they can modify the function of the enzyme with a couple other, there are a couple other mechanisms for moderating or regulating protein function, right? So the primary structure creates the protein shape. And remember, protein shape, shape is e equals the function, right? If we look up here, right, the, the enzyme's shape creates the function. Okay. But cells have to have, I'm, I'm reading right here, cells have to have a way to control or regulate enzyme activity. Sometimes a cell doesn't, if, if it releases an enzyme into a bunch of substrate, that enzyme is going to keep working and keep working and keep working until all that substrate is used up. But sometimes the cell doesn't want to do that. It wants to carry out the reaction for a little while and then stop. Or it needs to increase the reaction for some time and then slow it down for some time. And there are a couple of different mechanisms to make that possible. Um, so this is all about homeostasis, okay? Um, maintaining balance, right? Balance doesn't mean finishing a reaction. It means the cell does as much reaction as it wants to, and then it stops. Or it increases the reaction at some points and it slows down the reaction at others. So the other thing I was alluding to that you should be aware of are some of the ways that's possible and you should be able to differentiate them. So here's one example. Here we have the enzyme. And we have this thing called a coenzyme, sometimes called a cofactor, okay? But notice, if this was our substrate right here, this red thing, it wouldn't have fit into the active site of this protein on its own. The active site is shaped wrong. So the substrate can't work. Well, if you put the coenzyme in, now you have the right shape, and the substrate can go in, and this is how the enzyme becomes active. So with you need so in this case, you don't just need the enzyme in the substrate, you need a coenzyme to regulate it. So the cell could increase the amount of coenzymes, making more of the enzymes function, increasing the reaction rate, right? So coenzymes are used to, their function is to increase reactions, okay? So you can think of this like uh, the gas pedal on a car. Right? If you push down on the gas pedal, the car is going to speed up. If you add more coenzymes, the reaction is going to go faster. If you let off of the gas pedal, the car is going to slow down. And if you take away coenzymes, the reaction is going to occur more slowly. Okay, Because you need the coenzymes. They have to be working. So this is the gas pedal. Okay. 
Interestingly, we hear a lot about vitamins, like you should get a balanced vitamins or there's lots of good vitamins in your vegetables. Uh, vitamins, most often, not most often, often their job is to act as coenzymes. Like that's why vitamins are so important. So you might, you might have all the the, you might have all the right materials in your body and your body's made all the right enzymes, but your body isn't working correctly because you don't have the vitamins necessary to make those, um, those enzymes fit, right? The substrate. You can have the substrate, you can have the enzyme, but they don't fit, right? The gas pedal isn't being pushed down. Okay. Now, sometimes the car, uh, the car, the cell wants to slow down reactions, so how could it do that? Well, it could use coenzymes and it could uh, it could reduce the amount of coenzymes somehow, right? That's like taking your foot off the gas. Well, that'll slow down a reaction. But there's another way to slow down a car. You can hit the brakes. And competitive and non-competitive inhibition are like the brakes on a car, okay? Now, if you were to slam on the brakes and slam on the gas at the same time, you know what would happen? Your engine would rev up, but your car wouldn't move forward. It's really hard on your engine. Don't do it. But brakes are actually stronger than the gas pedal of your car. So if you were to press them both at the same time, the brakes would win. And inhibition, slowing down the reaction, in the same way is stronger than uh, the effect of coenzymes. Okay, so here's how it works. There's two main kinds. They slow reaction by competing for the active site if it's competitive inhibition. And so here we have a competitive inhibitor. It fits into the active site. And then that means the substrate, which should be going into the active site, can't get in there. Okay, um, they bind to the active site, but the enzyme can't really do anything to the competitive inhibitor. So it just sits there, it like fills up the enzyme and now the enzyme can't work. Okay, and this would slow down the reaction. Now, some of you might be like, well, that just permanently destroys the enzyme, doesn't it? Yeah, kind of, except um, it's still a bond right here. So there's a, there's a bond between these two things. And um, as a result of energy uh, and random motion, occasionally competitive inhibitors will hop off of an enzyme. So they don't damage the enzyme and they will eventually fall off. Um, competitive inhibitors can also like slowly degrade and so they break down faster than the enzyme does. This is what it'll do to the reaction rate. If the reaction rate, so this is a rate diagram and substrate concentration, if the reaction rate is normally very, very fast and then slows down, competitive inhibition, you still ultimately will get all of the enzyme activity, just takes longer to get there. Okay. Oh, that drew a weird shape. Okay, last one is non-competitive inhibition. So if competitive inhibition, the inhibitor is competing with the substrate for the active site, non-competitive inhibition is when you've got your enzyme, you got your substrate, and the substrate will fit into the enzyme just fine, and then you have an inhibitor. The inhibitor doesn't fit into the active site. The inhibitor fits into a different area called an allosteric site. Again, that's worth knowing that word. Is that the main thing I want you to know? No, but you should hear it. You should know what it is. You maybe even have notes where you can go find it. The allosteric site is just a place on the enzyme where if the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, um, it changes the shape of the enzyme, and now the active site becomes inactive. So here the active site is active without the inhibitor, and the substrate could connect. But as soon as you put the non-competitive inhibitor in the allosteric site, now we have a new shape, and now the enzyme doesn't fit. And as a result, no reaction, okay? All of these, this is like the brakes on a car. And these are used by the cells to stop or slow down reaction rates. So they produce enzymes intentionally that have allosteric sites or that have or they can also produce competitive inhibitors so that they can kind of speed up and slow down those reactions. Because in big picture, enzyme activity, it's the like lifeblood of the cell. It's where kind of everything is happening. 
So you want to be able to speed up the stuff that's happening or slow it down. And these are some of the processes the cell has to do that. And that's how you should think of it. These are regulation processes. And that's 